yes, we'll understand it all by and by. The day will come that uh, all things will be clear. And one of the observations that Solomon had made in his uh, book, The Ecclesiastes, is that he saw so many injustices. He saw the, the unrighteous prosper while the righteous not. And so there was such a disparity. And by all uh, uh, thoughts of what's right, what's just, what's fair, especially the God, those who love God and abide by His will, yet suffer as they do, as they strive to make do in this world, and yet they see that the, it's the unrighteous who prosper in this world. And, and that's the case. That's the case, and it, it's, it, we have to keep in mind what the real victory is and where the real prosperity is. Tonight's lesson is, I've named it, God is not mocked, particularly from the, the text verse, Galatians 6, 7. We'll look at that toward the end of the, of the, of the uh, sermon. Uh, but uh, that we should not be deceived, though. God is not mocked. God is not mocked. There are those who, who prosper in this world thinking nothing of God. And as you know, many people today take for granted and even ridicule the idea of God and his authority over all the universe. They ridicule it, and they take him for granted. Many would go as far as ridiculing him and in, in, uh, uh, making fun of the very idea that there is a God who has created all things and how deluded Christians are, or anybody who believes in the one true living God. Uh, but why? I imagine they do not have that favor the idea of being responsible for their own lives or, and having to give an answer to a greater authority than theirs. Nevertheless, God is. God is real. And he, he doesn't merely exist. God is. He's living. Um, and he's, of course, over all that he has created. There is coming a day in which all will face him at the judgment. Those who are scoffing now will be found wanting. They will be found having discovered they were wrong. And all those who believed God's word were right. The Bible gives us many words of warning so that, he, that man can change his ways and take advantage of the merciful grace which God extends through his son, Jesus Christ. So tonight, let's look at two very famous and powerful people who took God for heaven, the God of heaven for granted, Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon and King Herod, and the, the, what they looked at. Let's first turn to the book of Daniel, the book of Daniel, uh, as we look at Nebuchadnezzar first, as a man, a king, a great one of power that God had given him this authority, and yet he took God for granted. Um, as a matter of fact, we can remember in chapter 2 when uh, Nebuchadnezzar was first introduced to Daniel's ability to interpret dreams, of course, coming from the Father in heaven, that he was able to interpret the dream for King Herod. And as, as he had uh, interpreted the dream for King, in fact, it's very interesting that God had used this Gentile king to teach, to prophesy, to reveal to us God's plan to set up a kingdom in the latter days, during the days of the fourth kingdom after, after Herod, actually the third kingdom after Herod, Herod being the first kingdom, then following him would be the Medo-Persians, and following him would be the Macedonian Empire under Alexander the Great, and following him would be the Roman Empire, under which God would establish that kingdom, which we understand to be the church, and we read about the history of its establishment the, uh, in Acts chapter 2, after it was proclaimed by John the baptizer, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, but also by Jesus Christ himself, and who instructed his disciples also to preach, repent ye for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The very kingdom that is prophesied in Daniel chapter 2. But note, as Daniel had, had told him these things, look at verse 47. The king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret, this dream that he had just had. Then the king made Daniel a great man and gave him many great gifts and made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief of the governors over all the wise men of Babylon. Then Daniel requested the king and he set Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of the province of Babylon but Daniel sat in the gate of the king. So the king Nebuchadnezzar recognized that Daniel, re, being able to interpret him, had received this wisdom from God, the, the true God, and he made Daniel, of course, with great responsibility. So it's very interesting that in this dream, none of his wise men could interpret the dream. He appeals to Daniel, Belteshazzar, to interpret it. As we look in Daniel chapter 4, where, where in particular, where Nebuchadnezzar... Uh, 
pretty much neglects God and rec to recognize him as the one the true God. I, you know, that's just it. Nebuchadnezzar knew in his mind that Daniel was the spokesman, as it were, that, 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 that Daniel has been revealed. God has revealed secrets to, to Daniel, through, through Daniel. And as we see in, in, in chapter 4, that Nebuchadnezzar has another dream. And his, none of his wise men, just as the first dream, none of his wise men could tell him the dream or interpret it. So it was here that none of his wise men could even interpret this dream. So he turns to Daniel, who is his, his, uh, his Chaldean name was uh, Bel Belteshazzar. In, in honor of the, uh, the uh, uh, Chaldean gods. Okay. And, and so he turned to him to, to interpret this dream. As we begin in verse 18, looking at this, this dream, I can't, this is where Daniel interprets the dream. We'll be doing some significant reading because I can't improve upon the, the, the text. I can't improve upon God's word. So as we read this, let's, it will reveal to us the situation. And so this dream I, King Nebuchadnezzar, have seen. Now thou, O Belteshazzar, declare the interpretation thereof, for as much as all the wise men of my kingdom are not able to make known unto me the interpretation, but thou art able, and for the spirit of the holy gods is in thee. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonied for one hour, and his thoughts troubled him. The king spake and said, Belteshazzar, let not the dream or the interpretation thereof trouble thee. Belteshazzar answered and said, My lord, the dream be to them that hate thee, and the interpretation thereof to thine enemies. In other words, this is not good for you, Nebuchadnezzar. It's, it's rather good for your enemies. Okay. The tree that thou sawest which grew and was strong, whose height reached into the heaven, and the sight thereof to all the earth, whose leaves were fair, and the fruit thereof much, and in it was meat for all, under which the beasts of the field, field dwelt, and upon whose branches the fowls of the heaven had their habitation, it is thou, O king, that art grown and become strong. For thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. So the kingdom that Nebuchadnezzar was, was put over, the kingdom of Babylon, it was, a great, it was the greatest empire of the day. And God working through this empire, doing his will, um, particularly, yes, yes, the, the, the kingdom of Babylon had invaded the southern kingdom of Judah, had laid waste to them, laid waste to their temple, taken away the brightest and best of, of uh, the nation of Israel, and the, the kingdom of Judah, and to serve in his own kingdom. And uh, yes, it was fulfilling God's purpose, considering that it was Israel had, had, that had turned its back upon God and turned to idols. And so God allowed to happen to them what had, they had promised through Moses, that if they turned to idols, that God would allow them to be taken off the earth. So yes, Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom of Babylon was serving God's purpose in punishing Israel, that is punishing Judah, for their sins against God. Now, in addition to this, I, we see God working through Daniel to reveal so many rich things of him prophesying of the kingdom that God would establish the church. But also here, we see an example of, of those who would uh, take God for granted, not respect or understand the blessing. So, so God, understand that civil governments are proved to God. They are authorized by God. God put, uh, allowed them to put in, be put in place for our benefit, to reward the doers of good and punish the evildoers. Okay? So Nebuchadnezzar was a, was a part of that plan of God. And as God had allowed his kingdom to, to thrive and to flourish, and that's exactly what we see in this dream. Okay? Um, as Daniel had said in verse 22, It is thou, O king, thou that, that art grown and become strong, for thy greatness is grown and reacheth unto heaven, and thy dominion to the end of the earth. And whereas the king saw a watcher and holy one coming down from heaven and saying, Hew the tree down. Now this watcher refers to angelic beings who come and is so, uh, saying to hew this tree down, which was Nebuchadnezzar. This tree represented Nebuchadnezzar in his dream. Hew the tree down and destroy it, yet leave the stump of, of the roots thereof in the earth, even with a band of iron and brass and the tender grass of the field, and let it be wet with the dew of heaven, and let his portion be, be with the beasts of the field, till seven times pass over him. Now, so we see that this is a very figurative dream. 
Just as the, the dream, first dream that, that Daniel interpreted in Acts chapter, or rather Daniel chapter 2, that it was very figurative, but Daniel interpreted it uh, as, as God gave him the wisdom. So this also is very figurative. And so as Daniel g- gives the interpretation here in verse 24, this is the interpretation, O king, and this is the, cr- the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord, the king. Notice the, the, the uh, uh, respect that Daniel gives this king of this great empire that was due him as he calls him Lord the, his Lord the king. He was in the king's service at his gates, in his, in his courts. Okay? But he's talking about the Most High, of course, which is the God of heaven. In verse 25, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. It's showing the sovereignty of God in his absolute authority over all things, including the governments of men. Um, and, and so, and verse 26, And where is thy command... Uh, they commanded to leave the stump of the tree roots. Thy kingdom shall be sure unto thee. After that, thou shalt have known that the leaves do, or the he- that that the heavens do rule. Okay, so so it was coming that that uh, Nebuchadnezzar would be cast out to eat like a to live like a wild beast. Okay, and so with this understanding that concerned Daniel, that that. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar is going to suffer like this. So he makes a plea to the king, Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee, and break off thy sins by righteousness, and thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. So the plea was, change your ways, change your life, be right with God. And isn't that the, the request, the plea today of the gospel message to all men to to, to uh, plead with them to turn from their evil ways, from their sinful ways, turn to God, that perhaps they might find, might find forgiveness of sins if they, uh, um, if they do exactly what the commandments say, what Jesus Christ commanded, what the Peter commanded in Acts chapter 2, what they should do in order to find forgiveness of sins. And so it was that perhaps the lengthening of thy tranquility. So in verse 28, all this came upon the king Nebuchadnezzar. It, that was pretty simple. All this happened. So how did it come to be? And at the end of 12 months, a year had passed, he walked in the palace of the kingdom of Babylon. Notice what he says here in verse 30. The king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? He's sort of gloating here, boastful. He said, look what I have done, these great marvelous works to great, create this great city and this great kingdom. Look what I have done, forgetting what Daniel had told him about, that God had allowed him and put him in this place, allowed him to flourish. Well, look in verse 31. While the word was in his king's mouth, there fell a voice from heaven saying, O King Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken. The kingdom is departed from thee. And they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field. They shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and seven times shall pass over thee, until thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now, it, it's interesting to note that this seven times shall pass over him. It's not clear if it means seven years. If it were seven months, it probably would have been... Uh, declared, but this seven peri- seven uh, seven times, it's not clear. We look at the, the the number seven, what it might represent. We you know we can go to uh, the prophecies, and particularly in the Book of Revelation, where n- numbers have specific meanings. In this case, the number seven represents the perfect number. You, you take the number four, the number three. The three is the perfect uh, divine number. You think of the Trinity and such. The four is the perfect earthly or uh, uh, yeah, earthly number. Put them together, you get the perfect fullness number. You look at the number 666. You've heard that a lot, right? From the book of Revelation, talk about the mark of the beast of 666. That's three times six. Or six repeated three times. Or repeated twice. But, but the idea being that seven is the perfect number. Six is less than perfect. Six is the counterfeit. Six 
is the fake. And three times that, it's the perfect counterfeit. The mark of the beast is a perfect counterfeit for God. And he, rep he can make himself out to be an angel of light. Okay. Well, as we look at the number seven, it is fulfillment. It is the perfect number. It's like mature. So as we look at the seven times that would pass over him, it would be whatever was required to, to uh, fulfill God's purpose. Perhaps seven years, but certainly the proper amount of time to pass. So, we see in verse 33, the same hour was the thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar. And he was driven from men, and did eat grass as oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till his hairs were grown like eagles' feathers, and his nails like birds' claws. And at the end of days, I, Nebuchadnezzar, lifted up mine eyes into heaven, and mine understanding returned unto me, and I blessed the Most High, and I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. Note these are the words in the first person of King Nebuchadnezzar recognizing the sovereignty of God, the power of God, the authority of God over all things. And all the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing, and he doeth according to his, his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth, and none can say his hand or say, none can stay his hand or say unto him, what doest thou? Who are we to question God? That's pretty much what, what uh, Nebuchadnezzar was saying, he recognized the authority <coughs> based upon what happened to him. He had no control over it, and he recognized it. And so he gives credit to God that he will do what he will. None can impede him, none can prohibit him, and none can question him. In verse 36, at the same time my reason returned unto me, and for the glory of my kingdom mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors and my lords sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellent majesty was added unto me. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the king of heaven, all whose works are truth, and his ways judgment. And those that walk in pride he is able to abase. Who would know better than Nebuchadnezzar? Those who walk in pride, he is evil to abase, bring to naught, bring low. And, and we must understand this, that our own legislators and executives <coughs> and our own, all in the, the various branches of our government, if they were recognized the lesson that Nebuchadnezzar had learned, how, how things could be that we would honor God, glorify him, uh, and... and uh, just as, as it had been in the past where we would glorify God instead of malign Him, I think that many things would turn around, many blessings would happen. As we look at the events in the history, in the, in the, in the Old Testament, that about those who, who uh, in, tried to uh, uh, resist God and the results, and then you look at those who align themselves with the will of God and the blessings that came from it, 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 uh, it stands to follow that if we followed suit like those, like Nebuchadnezzar, we would perhaps find many rich blessings in our glorifying God. That's not salvation, though. Don't confuse that with salvation that is found only in Christ as we consider the, the gospel plan of salvation wherein one finds forgiveness of his sins. Now, that's one example where... Uh, we see that God is not going to be taken for granted, maligned, or mocked. Okay. Next would be a very short example, King Herod in Acts chapter 12. Very short example um, we see here, Acts chapter 12. In fact, it's only three verses long. There's a lot that could be told about this, but for our purposes tonight, we'll just look at these three verses and, and learn for the lesson from it. So as you see in, in uh, Acts 12, verse 21, beginning, And upon a set day, Herod, arrayed in royal apparel, sat upon his throne and made an oration unto them. So he, he made a speech. He made a, a, apparently an eloquent speech, an oration. He, and as it was, he was set in his royal garments, you know, and, and uh, all, the, I suppose, the pomp and, and circumstance all surrounding this. And as he ha made this oration, what happened? And the people gave a shout, saying, It is the voice of a God and not of a man. They were impressed with his speech. 
um, you know, we've, we've heard various uh, orators, speakers that have uh, uh, an ability to move many crowds, to move them to, to action, to move them to uh, understand and appreciate whatever he's speaking upon, the eloquence of the words that he would use, the, the phraseology to, to uh, uh, help us to appreciate his purpose. And so I, I perceive that Herod also, uh, a great orator, that, uh, and as he spoke, very well impressed them, as they would say, the voice of a god. And so it was, they were lifting him up very high upon a very tall pedestal. But look what, what he did. As, as this was, well, rather, I should say, what happened because, because of what happened. And immediately, the angel of the Lord smote him because he gave not God the glory. And he was eaten of worms and gave up the ghost. But the word of God grew and multiplied. So as what was the, the accusation against Herod? Well, he, he didn't give God the glory. He was taking glory that, des that God deserved. Okay, and so we can see that uh, uh, certainly it wasn't mocking God, but it was standing in a place where God should stand. That men have no right to take this glory and this honor, not to say that he didn't speak well. Obviously, he did speak well. But he took the credit of himself as having the voice of a god, as it were, instead of giving God the glory for the gifts that he had. Um, consider in the latter days the promise of, of the coming of Christ. You know, they're talking about scoffers. This is not exactly mocking God, but this is in the same level in, in, as we think about how people were going to be, in fact, are today. I'd like you to turn to 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. That uh, along the same lines about the kind of, of people it would be who would re reject or neglect the, uh, the authority of God, the, uh, the, the uh, greatness of God, and, and uh, well, if you're familiar with uh, secular humanism, you're well aware that uh, that involves rejecting the very idea of God and that we establish what's right and wrong. That we as mankind have this authority to make this, uh, it, to establish and, and uh, to establish that what is right and what is wrong. That we can say this is right, but this is a sin. We won't use the word sin. We'll just use this is not good for us, or right or wrong, okay? And so with the secular humanism, man puts himself upon that pedestal. He worships himself, basically. As we think about those who reject God and his sovereignty, his authority, we, I'd like to look at this, uh, 2 Peter 3, and I, I put it a, uh, as a close, relevant um, passage regarding it. 2 Peter 3, beginning in verse 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior. So this is what, not something that just Peter was, was writing about, talking about. This is something that the prophets of the Old Testament were, had been written, warning them. And it was something that also not he himself, apostle, uh, an apostle of Christ, but also all the other apostles that were saying the same thing. All his... Uh, um, all those who were uh, concurrent with him, okay? Um, we've seen in, in verse 3, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers walking up their own lusts. This last days, there is so, mu so much misunderstanding about this use of the word last days. So often they say, well, we see the signs of the times. They go back to Matthew chapter 24. They see where Jesus spoke about the signs of the coming of his judgment upon Jerusalem. And he gave specific signs, you know, that, that about events that would lead up to the, the destruction of Jerusalem, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem, and his judgment upon Jerusalem for all the innocent blood shed upon this earth, particularly those of the prophets. And so they see, well, these are the signs of the times of the end of the world. Well, that's not what Jesus was talking about. Jesus was talking about the signs leading up to the destruction of Jerusalem, which happened in A.D. 70. That's been a long time since that happened. Unfortunately, there are so many of us who haven't studied classical history, I guess you might say. 
where the Romans circled Jerusalem and laid waste to it, okay, just as Jesus had prophesied. And, and what's interesting, that those historians that were writing in them, just, uh, Josephus was one of them, indicated that not one Christian died in this massacre. Not one Christian. They all heeded the, the, the warnings that Christ had given first the apostles, and the apostles also taught other Christians that they fled when they saw the abomination of desolation, as, as Jesus put it, which Daniel had referred to in his prophecies. Okay. And so, uh, but the, he later, as going on after giving those signs of the times, he went on to say, that, but the, the, day, the last day, the day of judgment, when I come for the second time, when I literally come, no one knows that's going to happen, not even the Son of Man. Jesus did not even know when that day would happen himself at that time. But he did emphasize he would come as a thief in the night. And in other words, there aren't going to be any signs of his second coming. When he comes, it's going to be, it could be a very big surprise for those who aren't prepared. That's why we're admonished to watch and pray so we are prepared, ready when Jesus does come. Is he going to come in our lifetime? Maybe. Uh, we don't know. We don't know when he's going to come. But what if he comes in the next two hours? We'll be prepared. What if he comes next year? Will we be prepared? Yeah. We don't know. So that, that we, are, we are admonished to watch and pray that we are prepared. Nevertheless, we think about the last days. These last days have been those days since Christ died upon the cross. At that point, Christ fulfilled the law of Moses, ushering in the last age of existence in, in the, this physical existence on this earth. Because you, you look at the three great dispensations from the very beginning, the patriarchal age, where the patriarch served as the priests of his household or his tribe. And God spoke to the, the, uh, them through, through these patriarchs, the fathers of the, of the tribe or the family. And then when the law of Moses was given, the Mosaic age, the priests were of the Levitical tribe, the tribe of Levi, and they were th through whom God spoke, that, and the prophets, God spoke to the prophets in those days. But today, God speaks to us through his son, Jesus Christ. And with Christ dying upon the cross, putting the law of Moses to death, that is, putting it away, fulfilling it, putting it out of the way, and so ushering in the new Christian age, which it are, is the last days. These are the last days. So as we see here, um, knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, these days, scoffers walking after their own lusts, and saying, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Nothing's changed. In fact, that he used the word creation. Very interesting. Today, there's so many that deny that there ever was a creation, that everything happened by happenstance, by, by chance, by, by probability, you know, such, such minutely small probability on the order so small, it's, it, it's way beyond impossible, as, as um, speaking of, of uh, re, uh, <laughs> um, reality, you know, real probability. It's the order of it is very small. But he uses the term since creation. And so even those in those days, even his Jews, Jewish friends, they say everything's happening just like it was from the creation. Nothing's different, nothing's changed, so nothing's going to ever change. You know, um, for since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. For this, they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. We look at, read about the creation of the, of the earth in the book of Genesis, how he had... Uh, separate the waters with the firmament between the two. So there, were, there had the waters on the, on the surface of the earth, and there were waters above the atmosphere that God had created that were let loose uh, in, in the flood of Noah. Now, so they purposely ignore this. They're willingly ignorant of this, about this, the, by the word of God, the heavens of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. Talk about Noah's flood. They willingly ignore this, that the whole earth was destroyed by a flood. Okay. 
whereby the world that then was, being overflowed with water, perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now, that we are living on now, um, by the same word are kept in store, reserved in the fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. He's talking about the end of the world. That when the judgment comes, everything will be burnt up with fervent heat. Nothing will remain. All the great works that we, we imagine we have done will perish the great pyramids of Egypt. All the, all the, the wonders of the, of the world that there are will perish and none of the great works that we have done as, as, a, as a creation of God ha, that, will, will, that will last. Verse 7, But the heavens and the earth that which are now by the same word are kept in store, reserved to fire against the day of judgment. But, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant as of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. So God is not on the same time schedule as man is. As a matter of fact, time is, is relatively inexpensive. In, uh, uh, Ir relatively irrelevant to God in the sense that uh, time as we measure it is insignificant to him. Whereas we see a lifetime as 70 or 80 years, to him that's just a small speck of existence. And, and so the fact that whether he delays 10 years, 100 years, 1,000 years, 10,000 years, whatever he delays, it's insignificant because he doesn't measure time like we measure time to him, and the fullness of time, when it's ready, that's when he uh, does his will. So, and so the conclusion is, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's not a slacker. He's not lazy. He's not a, uh, uh, one who puts things off. Okay, but is long-suffering to usward. That's the goodness of God. He's putting up with us. He's long-suffering, allowing us to continue. Why? Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's the desire of God, that we should all come to repentance, appeal to him for forgiveness of sins. And he goes into verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the, which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It's going to happen. It's a reality. It just hasn't happened yet. For the, and it's been almost 2,000 years since Christ left this, left this earth. It's been a long time. And so it's easy for men to say, well, it's been, you know, where is the promise of his coming? It's easy to go sit back and say, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's been almost 2,000 years, and you think it's going to happen now? In fact, they would use this as, as a... a, a something to, to comfort them, feeling that there's not going to be a judgment. Okay. But it will happen as a thief in the night. And so in verse 11, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved, what manner of persons ought ye to be in all holy conversation and godliness? Looking for and hastening unto the coming of the day of God. Is that what we're looking for? Is that what we're excited about? That Christ is going to return that all things will be destroyed, just like he said. That, uh, are we looking for that? Looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God, wherein the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, look for new heavens and a new earth, wherein dwelleth righteousness. Wherefore, beloved, seeing that ye look for such things, be diligent that ye may be found of him in peace, without spot and blameless. And that's the encouragement, the exhortation from Peter be prepared. It's coming. And we shouldn't neglect God. Now, I had mentioned the, that God is not mocked from Galatians chapter 6. Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, beginning. God is not mocked. You know, some people will mock God. Some people make fun of him as a silly idea. And, so, and, they, and they look at us and with pity in their thoughts that... They're deluding themselves and they're, they're conforming their lives in such a way, restricting themselves. That's not necessary because it's not going to happen. They're wasting their life away. But as we, we hear it, it's a matter of faith. Do we believe what the apostle said? Do we believe that the Son of God said about this? In Galatians 6, 7, Galatians chapter 6, verse 7, Paul wrote to the church in Galatia, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. 
For whatsoever man that soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. So we can sow to the f flesh. We can go for the gusto. We go around once in life. You should go for all the gusto, right? And that's, that's the, the uh, Paul philosophy of many in this world. We've got to get as much as we can out of this. Enjoy it as much as we can. In fact, the more money I have, the more affluence and influence I have, the more enjoyable this life will be. But like I said, these, these 70 years or 80 years around this earth are just but a brief fractional moment in all eternity. And so we're exhorted by Paul to be not deceived, understanding that God is not mocked. If we sow to the flesh, we will reap of the flesh, which is death. But if we sow to the Spirit, if we focus upon spiritual matters, if we spoke, focus upon the Word of God, and I'm not talking about, you know, we can focus on spiritual matters. There are a lot of people that think on the spiritual plane, but not about the God of the Bible. They think upon spiritual matters, realizing that this physical is not everything we are, that our being is imperceptible to our human eyes, our spirit. And so they understand that, and so they focus upon valuable values. Eh, how's that? They focus on being good people, being healthy, spiritually speaking people, having a good, good thoughts, having good attitudes about life, kindness toward others. And these are spiritual matters that, that in and of themselves are, are, are great goals, but you know, as Christians, we should also seek these things, which God reveals to us. You know, we, we, we re rely upon the wisdom that comes, comes down from above. That's not originated in man. And so, as we consider spiritual matters, it's not about just s general spiritual matters. It's about the God of the Bible and the Son of God who came to shed his, die upon the cross, shedding his blood upon that cross, that we might have forgiveness of sins. That's the purpose of God to save us from the consequences of our sins, because we know that, uh, as, as Romans 3.23 tells us, that all has sinned and come short of the glory of God. We have sinned and we continue to come short of the glory that God intended for us. We are made in God's image. We are children in that sense of Him. But then, as, as, as mankind has sinned, made itself an enemy of God, but God has redeemed us and bought us back through, the, through Jesus Christ who paid the price for our sins. That if we respond to that mercy and graciousness of God in the appropriate way, as Jesus said, except you, the, uh, except you believe that I am he, you, should, you shall perish your sins. Hebrews 11.6 For without faith it's impossible to be well pleasing to God. For, for we must first believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that seek after him. Okay? So faith is essential regarding spiritual matters. Faith in God, faith in Christ, confessing Jesus Christ as the Son, the Son of God is essential. In fact, Jesus said, Whosoever therefore will confess me before men, him will I confess before my Father which is in heaven. What does that mean to confess us before the Father? It means... He's one of those believers that I died for and shed my blood for and is covered by my blood. So his sins are forgiven if he's repentant of the contrite heart. That's spe that, is the, that is confessing us before the Father. So whosoever therefore will confess it before men, him will also confess before, before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I deny before my Father, which is in heaven. It makes sense. Isn't it reasonable that if we deny Christ, that he's the Son of God, that Christ would have none of us? That makes sense. By the same token, being uh, confessing Christ as the Son of God, that's still not the whole story. That's still not the whole story. We understand we have faith, and we also understand we need to confess Christ but we also understand we need to, to repent of our sins because it's the sins for which Christ died. And so we need to turn from our sins, 
appealing to God for forgiveness of sins, and the first time we ever get forgiveness of sins and when we appeal to him in the manner of that, that answer of a good conscience toward God, 1 first, uh, first Peter 3.21. It's talking about baptism, which also doth now save you. Not the putting away the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience toward God. One who has a good conscience toward God, his appealing to God for forgiveness of sins, the right answer is being baptized for remission of sins. As Peter told those, those people in, on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when they, he was telling them about Jesus Christ was made both Lord and Christ, Jesus Christ, whom you have crucified through the hands of lawless men. They recognized what they'd done, and so they asked the relevant question, men and brethren, what must we do? And Peter said, repent ye and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Acts 2, 38. So we see, if we look at all these things that we need to do to be saved, to find forgiveness of sins, put them together, and we realize we have to have faith in God and Christ. We have to confess Jesus Christ as the Son of God. We need to repent of our sins and be baptized for the remission of our sins. And then, as it's revealed for us in Acts uh, chapter 2, that the Lord adds those who have obeyed that, who've done that, to his body, the church. As he said, verse 47, that uh, the Lord added daily those that should be saved. Added daily to the church those that should be saved. So as, we, as people might, might look at God's plan of salvation, they might make fun of it, saying, I'm saved by grace. Well, I'm saved by faith. Yes, we are, but not faith only and not grace only and not anything only. We're saved by the blood of Christ. We're saved by the, the, uh, the works that God has done. We're saved by our own works in the sense that we have obeyed God. Not self-meritorious works whereby we earn our way into heaven. No. We do those things we're commanded by God, including being baptized for remission of sins, to find forgiveness. If we love Christ, we'll keep his commandments. If you need to respond to the gospel invitation tonight, then come forward as we stand and as we sing.